<laughs> All right. Uh, thank y'all for joining us uh, here. It's great to see folks here uh, at the center. Um, uh, lovely crowd here. And, and uh, welcome to the uh, folks joining us online. Um, we're, we're excited that you could, you could join us. And we're particularly excited about uh, our speaker today. Uh, I, I met Paul Matheny when I first moved to Columbia, South Carolina, uh, some time ago <laughs> in the past. Uh, and we worked together for years with the South Carolina Traditional Arts Network uh, and with uh, folklore and uh, with folk life, uh, folk artists, traditional artists in the state. Um, and uh, you know, Paul has ties to the local community here, working at the uh, York uh, County Museum for, for years uh, before moving down to Columbia. But let me, let me officially introduce Paul. Paul Matheny is the Chief Curator and Director of Collections at the South Carolina State Museum. Paul received his Master of Arts in Art Administration and Bachelor of Fine Arts degrees from Winthrop, Winthrop University. In 1997, he accepted the position of Assistant Curator of Art at the Museum of York County until 2001, when he accepted the position of Curator of Art at the South Carolina State Museum. He served as the Chief Curator of Art at the Museum from 2002 to 2014, Chief Curator of Collections from 2014 to 2015, and currently serves as the chief curator and director of collections. So, collections, good, all together. During this time at the South Carolina State Museum, he has curated more than 30 major ex exhibitions focusing on the work of South Carolina artists and craftspeople. So, please well, uh, join me in welcoming Paul Matheny. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. That was great. Hello, everybody. How are y'all doing? Good. It's good to see everybody here today. Thank y'all for coming. Um, it's really great to be here. Thanks, Stephen and Chris and Ashley and the Native American Studies Center staff for asking me to be here. Um, Chris contacted me maybe a year or more ago um, and asked if I'd be interested in coming down. And, you know, a year or more ago, I wasn't exactly sure at that time, you know, where would we be? We've been through a lot and done a lot. So it's really great to be able to be here in person, see everybody here and share this information with y'all. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Stephen. As Stephen mentioned, you know, I've been working with South Carolina art and artists for a fairly long time. Um, I'm from South Carolina. I grew up in the upstate. I grew up in Anderson. Um, I was actually born in Texas, but I was only there for about six weeks. So um, I've always been involved with the art community in some way, shape, or fashion. But one part of that that I've always really loved is pottery and ceramic arts. You know, pottery and ceramic arts is such a important part, not just for visual arts for the state of South Carolina, but the history of our state as well. Um, and the State Museum has a really great collection that sort of represents that. Um, hopefully y'all have had a chance to come by the State Museum in Columbia, but just to give y'all some information, when you think about a state museum or historical institution, you think of these very ancient, old sort of museums that have been around forever. But the South Carolina State Museum actually started and was commissioned in 1974. So we're a fairly young institution um, when you get down to it. Um, we haven't even been around for 50 years as a formal institution. We actually started the museum in its current location in 1988. Um, so even shorter period of time, but we've been collecting ever since we started. You know, the first year the museum existed was uh, or the commission uh, as a collecting body was in 1974. Um, and our first object came in in 1975, which was actually a notary stamp from 1936, which was a very odd first object to bring into your collection. But we really started collecting in 1976. That's when the huge effort started happening to plan for building a museum that would open um, 12 years later on down the road. And from that, you can see on this first slide, just a broad range of some of the pottery and ceramics that are in our collection. There we go. Um, but in 1976, even early on, the first full year where we were collecting objects for the collection, the staff that were at the museum at that time knew that pottery and ceramics were an important part of what we needed to be focusing on. So that became part of the museum's collecting plan from the very beginning. Um, and it was really great to find this in the collection. In the first full year, second year, 1976, we acquired 14 pieces of Catawba pottery, which is really appropriate to be looking at and talking about here at the Native American Studies Center. So, it's really cool to see that and share that. But this was collected by Furman Baxter Rogers. Um, 
who actually worked for ETV, and he collected a small collection of Catawba pottery that we continue to build on um, even today. Also in the same year, in 1976, we acquired our first piece of alkaline glazed stoneware from Edgefield, South Carolina. So this particular vessel um, is post-Civil War. It was made around 1870 to 1880 or so. And this form has become a very iconic form, just like the King Hagler effigy pot from the Catawba. This particular Edgefield jug in this form was made regularly at the Miles Mill Pottery. And so this shape and this profile has become very well known and synonymous with what was made in Edgefield. Um, this is an early piece in the museum's collection. We don't have a whole lot of early prehistoric vessels, but this is one, it's a cooking pot um, that is in our collection that was donated to the museum. But we do have about 108 or so pieces of Catawba pottery. This is a bowl by Earl Robbins that we have in several different forms that build off of that. And I'm not gonna to focus too much on Catawba pottery since we're here um, at the Native American Station. I know that's something that um, y'all are all very familiar with, but just uh, in a nutshell, a lot of the Catawba forms are built off of the basic bowl shape that we have here, a flared rim bowl. And then this is Earl Robin snake pot. Um, this piece was actually donated by Tom and Kathy Stanley from Rock County. I'll talk about them in just a minute. This is a snake pot as well, made by Sarah Ayers, an Earl Robbins horse pot. This is an effigy bowl in our collection. And this is one of my favorite pieces um, in the collection too. Uh, it's a really special vessel made by Arzada Sanders. And she signed and dated the bottom of it from the 1980s with some more information on the bottom of this vessel. This is a very monumental large scale jar by Sarah Ayers. This was made in 1989 and the museum commissioned her to make this for the museum. And this is a Indian head pot by Earl Robbins, also a very large monumental vessel. And for those of y'all that knew Earl or are familiar with his work and have seen it here, you know of the craftsmanship and the scale of his work and how it's created. Another early FG vessel that we actually just acquired last year at the State Museum. This piece came up at auction. We're still continuing to build the collection. We do have a few pipes in our collection as well. An arrowhead pipe. This earlier piece pipe. For those of you that are familiar, I know some of y'all know everybody in this picture, but this is Viola Robbins, Margaret Robbins, and Paige Childers here. Um, this picture was taken about 1999 when I was working at the Museum of York County. Uh, I was working on an exhibit called The Difference in Dirt that looked at the historical context of South Carolina pottery and ceramic arts. Um, it was at the Museum of York County and it opened in 2000. And then it went to the Charleston Museum and then to the State Museum and I traveled with it. But here you can see Margaret Robbins coil building one of her vessels on her lap board on the front porch of Earl and Viola Robbins. She's processing their clay. And all these images were part of that um, difference in dirt project that we did a while back. These are some other images um, that are in the museum files that Steve Hewitt took um, probably in the 1980s. I believe, I'm um, not sure who this is in this picture, I don't have the notes with me, but they're digging clay. This is at Nisbet Bottoms. And my files say that this is Edith Brown, coil building a pot. And this is Sarah Ayers in her house in West Columbia, making a small picture. These are some of the tools. As y'all know, coil, uh, Catawba pottery is coil built pottery um, that is scraped down the coils are built on top of each other, scraped down, and then rubbed by the makers with these stones to smooth the surface and then pit fired. This is Fox Air's pit firing some pipes for the demonstration. I mentioned that we actively continue to collect. Um, this is the Tom and Kathy Stanley collection. I'm sure some of y'all um, knew Tom and Kathy. They recently moved to North Carolina, but um, they were both very active in the arts community in Rock Hill, South Carolina. 
and um, got to know a lot of the makers um, on the Catawba Reservation and were able to acquire some of their pieces. And prior to moving to North Carolina, they wanted to make sure that they left their collection in South Carolina and contacted us and donated about 30 pieces of their pottery to the museum. Um, they have continued to support the museum and continued to build the collection. Um, this is uh, a heron pot by Chief Bill Harris. And we're very fortunate to have this piece in the museum's collection. So there are about 108 or so pieces of Catawba earthenware in our collection. And then we also have a significant collection of other pottery from across the state. You know, South Carolina is probably most known for its Edgefield um, alkali glazed stoneware tradition that existed and started in about 1809 in the old Edgefield district of South Carolina. One of the most well-known and well-recognized potters was an enslaved craftsperson named Dave Drake. Um, he was known for his large scale pots um, this is about a 15 gallon storage jar from the top of the table. It's about this tall, and about this big around. Um, but the really incredible thing about Dave and his work is that he was able to read and write. Um, he was a literate slave, so he knew how to sign his name, he knew how to write the dates, but he also wrote poetic verses. Um, in addition to our collection that's permanently at the museum, we also have objects on loan. And there are two Edgefield pots I'm going to talk about. Um, that are on loan that are being shared with the public right now. So if you come to the museum, you can see them. But by having this um, pot on the left of the screen, um, we have an expansive 30-year representation of the work of Dave's work at the museum right now. Um, this piece on the left is actually just about a one-gallon storage jar. Storage jars were used in homes and smoke houses and things like that to store food products, whether it's smoked meat, or to store grains or flowers or things like that. They were made to be used. They weren't made to be exhibited and looked at as works of art. But the piece on the left is actually a very small vessel. Um, we were contacted by a family in Colombia that was cleaning out their house and said that they found something they thought might be interesting. They brought it in. And that pot is actually dated 1831. So it's a very early storage jar. Um, and the script is very similar to what Dave would have done and the form is similar to what Dave would have done. The piece on my side, on the right, um, is our latest vessel made by Dave at the museum. It came in in 2001, and it's dated 1861, and also has his signature. Oh, that one's not showing up. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that Dave was able to read and write, but he was well recognized for his poetic verses that he created and put on the sides of his vessels. Um, at that time, being an enslaved person, it was illegal for them to know how to read and write, but he was able to do it anyway. There's a lot of research going on um, to figure out how he learned how to read and write and why he did that, which is really great. There's a lot of debate and a lot of information about that that's being done um, and has been for a, quite a few decades. But the first pot and the earliest pot with a verse on it is from 1834, dated July 14th, and the, it's the one on the left. And the verse on that particular pot says, put every bet all between, surely this jar will hold 14. So that gives you kind of an idea of the poetic verses that he would inscribe on the sides of the pots. The really great thing about these pots is that they serve as a form of diary or a window into the life of the maker um, and what they were doing and, experiences, and experiencing on a daily basis. Um, I'm not sure why this image on the right-hand side is not showing up, but that's another pot that's on loan to the museum. Again, somebody called us and said, I have this pot. People keep knocking on my door and asking if they can buy it. And so I decided to pull it inside and contact y'all, which is really amazing that this pot was able to survive for that long. Um, both of these pots that are on loan were used locally in the Midlands at homes and farms um, and have survived and passed down through the family. They're both still in the same family, the two different families. But the pot that you can't quite see um, has a really amazing verse on it. It says, oh, the moon and stars, hard work to make big jars. And it's dated August 21st, 1834. Again, it's the exact same year as the pot that's in our collection, which came in in 1981. Um, so even early on, the museum was looking at the importance of these things. But it's really great to see these two pieces together. They were probably fired in the same kiln load in 1834. They're almost identical pots. They're the same size. They're both 14 gallons. Um, but to see the verse on the one on the right, it says, oh, the moon and stars, hard work to make big jars. Just think about it. If you've ever been to Edgefield, 
I'm sure most of y'all have driven through Edgefield. If you've ever been there in the summertime in particular, how hot and humid Edgefield can be. So just imagine being in a pottery shop and turning these giant, massive vessels. And then at the end of the day, just going outside and just breathing a breath of fresh air and gazing up at the sky and seeing the moon and the stars after a hard day in the pottery shop. I think it's just an amazing burst to have on a vessel. We're really fortunate to have it at the museum right now. We have an extensive collection of Edgefield pottery. Um, thanks to Charlie Ginolette um, and Peggy. You can see him on the left-hand side. But after they passed away, their family donated 94 pieces to the museum. The majority of them are Edgefield made pieces. Um, there are a few contemporary pieces and a few upstate pieces, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this is one of the larger pieces from the Charles and Peggy Ginolette collection on the right-hand side. This is a Thomas Chandler storage jar. Again, this would have been used to store um, some sort of food product, probably in a smokehouse and left there um, with the food in it for preservation purposes. This would have been before canning and before glass jars. That piece was probably made around the 1840s. It's a nine gallon four handled storage jar. <clears throat> and this is an early pot. Um, the Edgefield tradition started with the Landrum family in around 1809. So this is an early form. They were very ovoid in shape, light colored clay bodies and glazes. And this is a typical jug from that particular time period. This one does have an impressed mark. It's a small X right at the base of the handle. These have also become fairly recognizable pieces from the Edgefield tradition. These are Kalen slip decorated pieces from the Collin Rhodes factory. And um, these are still alkaline glazed stoneware pieces. Rather than how the topical fire they're aware and still do when pits dug into the earth, these pieces would be put into giant kilns, whether they're groundhog kilns or tunnel kilns, and then fired um, using wood um, up to about 2,000 degrees. So the surface is a very glassy surface. Um, and then the white that you see there is kaolin slip decoration. It's also from about the eight, late 1830s. Kalen slip decoration. This has a particularly rare mark on it. If you can see right here, this is called what people call the bug stamp. There are only a couple of pieces that have that, and this one came from the Genelette collection as well. All right, so we had a very, when I got to the museum in 2001, um, in working with the other curatorial staff there, we had two um, cultural history curators that were also working at the same time. Um, we recognized the significance of our Edgefield collection. It was absolutely well put together, well established. We had really good pieces that told an incredible story about South Carolina stoneware history. But there were also potters after 1809 that spread throughout the state to make pottery all over South Carolina and beyond. The Edgefield tradition in Alcorn Glaze stoneware was the first time safe pottery was being made. Prior to that, um, there may have been um, a short period of time where lead glazed earthenware was also being used, uh, which wasn't a safe way to make pottery for food production. So alkaline glazed stoneware became a safe way to do it. So that tradition spread to other areas across the state and beyond, including Columbia. This is a little coffee pot. It was made at the Columbia Landrum factory, which started in the 1840s, maybe a little bit later than that, and continued into the 20th century with the storks. But as I was working on the Difference in Dirt project, one thing that I came to realize was the importance of the upstate tradition um, outside of Edgefield. So the Greenville Spartanburg area had an area called the Jug Factory area. Even today, if you go up there off the Jordan Road, you'll cross the Jug Factory Road um, as well. At one time, there were probably about 12 or 13 potters active at the exact same time. These were more seasonal potters rather than in Edgefield where they were year round potters. Um, they were more rural, but they were also, in some cases, much more inventive, it seemed like. Um, one thing I recognized in doing the Difference in Dirt Project is that at that time, um, a lot of the upstate potters were not very well recognized. Um, people didn't know a whole lot about them. Um, and one in particular was Sam Welchel. And you can see this piece here. It's a three-gallon storage jar with stencil decoration made by Sam Welchel. Um, so that became one of our efforts to really kind of research more about this pottery and try to locate more pottery um, that we could acquire for the museum's collection. Shortly after we acquired this piece in about 2002, 
Um, another piece popped up that was both initialed and dated. So this is a northern storage jar, it's two gallons with stencil decoration, signed SW for Sam Welchel. And then the date is 1895, even though some of the um, iron slip is kind of missing from the production time period. And then in 2015, we were able to acquire this large vessel, five gallons, um, which says Sam Welchel, Gaffney, and then five gallons, also 1895. <clears throat> and then a few other pieces started popping up. So our efforts were to kind of help illustrate the expansiveness of what Welcher was making in form. This is a lidded jar that we just brought in two years ago, a one gallon preserved jar. But then I also look at his influence in his family. Um, so the piece on the left is stamped JW um, for one of his descendants. And then the piece on the right, which is a really interesting storage jar that has a teacup lid on top of it is also impressed stamped SW for two gallon, and it has a two gallon capacity up. But one of the earliest pottery families in the upstate of South Carolina was the Henson family. Um, and that was a really important part of the Distance and Dirt Project too, is getting to know some of the descendants of that. But these are pieces made by um, a contemporary potter, uh, his great uncle and his grandfather, David Carr and Jesse Bardry Henson. The Atkins were also in the upstate. Um, this is an Atkins flower pot in a funerary urn. And then the Mountain View pottery by the Claytons was also in the Spartanburg area. And they were also known for making some of other pieces of pottery besides just the functional stuff. You know, by the time a lot of these other potters were active in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of preserved glass preserved jars were available, like the mason jar and things like that. Uh, metal tin cans were being produced more. So they started making other objects, such as this um, cast bulldog that they would sell to continue to make money. This is the only documented African-American potter in the upstate. Uh, this is a piece made by Rich Williams that was probably made around 1910 or so. And it's stamped Rich Williams on the base. Then there are other areas around the state of South Carolina where pottery was being made as well. Uh, one of those, the most highly productive areas outside of Edgefield or the Spartanburg Greenville area was in Lawrence. Um, this pottery is a little bit different because this family uh, was the Johnson family who actually learned how to make pottery in Van Oak, North Carolina. They were coming down to South Carolina to sell their pottery that they were making in North Carolina and realized that there was more of a demand in this area where they were trying to sell stuff and there was really good clay um, to use to make pottery in that location too. So by 1878, they established their own pottery in Lawrence County in Lanford Station. And the piece on the left is a really early piece from about 1880 that was made at that pottery site. Later pieces on the right, like this four gallon churn, um, they evolved a little bit. They started using different types of material. They would get glass from the Coca-Cola plant in Lawrence and use that to crush up for their glazes. But then also a Georgia potter came to their location, Marilyn Hewell, and brought cobalt with him as well. Um, and so you can see the cobalt banding and then the cobalt number four. Now being at the Museum of York County and working on the Difference in Dirt Project, I was also really interested to find out more information about the pottery production in York County specifically, um, in addition to what the Catawbas were making. Um, some of the predecessors at the Museum of York County early on um, had identified the o and pottery at the Union District and Cherokee County area, the Boyle family and things like that. And they had a really wonderful collection. Um, there were a couple of pieces that they had that were really intriguing at the McKelvey Center up in New York County. And there were these marbleized bases similar to this one um, that really intrigued me. I was really curious about this because it was so different than anything else I'd ever seen. Um, so this is basically gardenware that was made at the Glasscock and Bennett Pottery Works in Leslie. So Leslie is right in New York County. It is really close to the Catawba Reservation. Um, and it was owned by John Glasscock. And the turner there was named Claude Bennett. Um, there was a general store, there was a post office, and then they had the pottery shop. All those things were all combined. Um, 
They made utilitarian pottery, so they made churns and they made pitchers, just like you would use on a daily basis. They also made cake pans and candle holders with braided handles. It's really interesting pottery. But they were most highly recognized for this marbleized gardenware that they produced. So this type of decoration is not a glaze that was applied during the firing process or as part of that, but this is actually cold painted pottery where after the pots were fired and after they had cooled, a lady at the shop named Ruby Boyd would take these to another area of the pottery shop and marbleize them using a water and oil-based paint resist and dip those into the surface. Just like if you're familiar with marbleizing paper and marbleizing books and things like that, it's the same process I've been doing this. I was fortunate enough to get to meet Jack Glasscock, who was the son of John Glasscock. So I was able to talk to him and find out a lot more information about this particular pottery shop. If you're not familiar with it, I'm not surprised. They only lasted for five years. They started out in 1927, and then by 1932, they were already out of business because of the depression. Um, you know, the interesting thing about pottery families too is that this was in the 1920s and 30s, and they were active in New York County, but all of these potters, for the most part, had descendants. Um, I live in Columbia now. I go to church at a place called McGregor Presbyterian Church, and there's a man there <coughs> named Ed Glasscock. I said, you know, I knew some Glasscocks when I lived in Rock, Rock Hill. He said, oh, well, I'm from New York County, and Ed Glasscock, who I'd known for years, um, was actually the grandson of John Glasscock that started this pottery shop, so we got to know each other through that, so. Um, it's really interesting to see those connections that still exist in South Carolina. Another York County potter was Martin Alexander Helton. Again, like the Johnson family, the Heltons and the Hiltons are very well known in North Carolina. And he came to the York County area in Western York County and started a pottery shop at the end of the 19th century that lasted a couple of years up until the um, 1900s. Very typical sort of utilitarian alkaline glazed stoneware. His pieces are marked M-A-H for Martin Alexander Helton. In Catawba, which is not too far from here, up the street, um, William Franklin Alton, or Uten, ran a pottery shop as well. Um, it, it changed hands a couple of times, but he was the most productive potter at that location, it seems like, um, in Catawba. I was able to talk to the owner of that property, and he said that at one point, there was a railroad track that went from, that had been laid by the potters at some point, from the pottery shop, so they could load the greenware onto the, onto a cart. It would follow the railway, the train track sort of, to the kiln to safely transport a large amount of pottery without having to carry it and move it around, which is really kind of inventive, you know, in the 1900s to 1920s. Anybody know what this is? <laughs> That's right. This is a chicken waterer, and this was also made by um, the Alton Pottery in Catawba, South Carolina, and it's stamped as well. <clears throat> now, my battery's running low. Do I need to plug this in, Chris or Steven? Ashley? <laughs> That's fine. I don't want the battery to run out. Another aspect of South Carolina pottery that's pretty well recognized is the Edgefield Face Vessel tradition, which has grown and expanded um, since the 1840s. One thing that's missing at the South Carolina State Museum's collection is a historic Edgefield Face Vessel. That's one thing that we do not have in our collection. There are probably about 140 total if you look broadly at Edgefield Face Vessel tradition. So there aren't that many, they're highly sought after. But even as early as the um, museum started, people, the staff have been trying to acquire an into a face vessel. We do have three early. We do have three fairly early face vessels from South Carolina um, in our collection. This is one example of Guy Doherty, who was active in Bethune. Wait. Maybe the computer will stay on. Um, who was active in Bethune, South Carolina. It's an Albany slip uh, face vessel that actually has tiny little pieces of gravel for the teeth. Uh, it's a small diminutive face jug. It's about this tall, probably about three and a half inches tall, four inches wide. 
<clears throat> we're really fortunate to have these two pieces of pottery. Um, the one on the left, you know, we were talking about the upstate pottery with the Hensons and the Claytons and the Belchers and all those people. And then the Atkins that made the two terracotta gardenware pieces with the scratched in decoration. The face vessel on the left is made by Leonard Atkins. It's a harvest form vessel with a face on it. And there are probably about 10 or 15 of these total that are known to exist. They were made about 1910, 1915 in that time period. So we're really fortunate to have that one. The one on my side, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, is a really interesting face vessel. Um, it was one that descended through a family in the upstate, um, in the Lyman area. Uh, there was the theory and idea that it came from the John Smith pottery shop, which it very well may have. The interesting thing is that, you know, there are about four or five pots that are signed Smith and Welter. So John Smith and Sam Welter were working together. John Smith was probably the proprietor of the shop, where Sam Welter was the turner and the maker. So this particular piece came from the John Smith family, and it was on loan to another potter, Billy Henson, who I mentioned earlier, um, to kind of use as inspiration as he was trying to restart his pottery shop, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you look closely at this, at the clay body, at the glaze, it also has iron slip decoration. So those early Welchel pieces I was talking about that had the central decoration, those were also iron slip decoration as well. So because Welchel was working with John Smith, there's a really good possibility that the space vessel could have been made by Sam Welchel at the John Smith site. Now this piece on the left is by Billy Henson, who was born in 1941, a couple of years after probably the last pottery shop had quit operating in the Spartanburg County area. But he was really intrigued with the pottery tradition because he grew up around the potters. He grew up seeing where the pottery shops were and hearing the stories about digging the clay and firing the kiln. So when he got probably in his 40s, he decided to build his own pottery shop and was looking at the old pots to kind of gain inspiration. So the Smith family was able to loan him this pot to use as inspiration for what became his sort of iconic face vessel. So this is a Billy Henson harvest vessel on the left-hand side, which actually has four faces on it um, as a direct inspiration from this earlier pot from about 1890, 1895. This is a picture of Billy Henson. I was really fortunate to get to spend a lot of time with Billy. I know people in the audience were able to meet him as well and spend time with him, but he was the last living potter in South Carolina that had a direct family connection in some way. The pot of to making pottery. The pottery tradition had actually ended by the time he was born or shortly after that, but he was still around the people to hear about it and get to know um, kind of what the process was and learn from it. Just a little bit. Um, he also met with other potters in North Carolina, read Foxfire books uh, to really figure out how to make his own pottery. But even when I got to know Billy, I probably met him in the late 1990s, 97, 98. There were still people connected to the Spartanburg pottery tradition that were around. So we were able to go around and visit some of them, talk to them, see some of the pottery that was made. Um, this is um, Lewis Clayton, I believe. It's one of the Clayton children. So the Clayton pottery shop was still active when he was alive. He told stories about riding the horse at the pottery shop that would run the pug mill and things like that. So. He was familiar with that pottery shop growing up with his family. You can see on the front steps, two flower pots that were made at the Clayton Pottery Shop, and then a pitcher on the right-hand side, which has a beautiful glaze. It's a really nice, rich olive sort of alkaline glaze, and a really nice form too. It's attributed to Albert Fulbright, who was one of the turners that was at the Clayton Pottery Shop. But Billy got to know these people, their family, his neighbors, and then his tradition um, became well known, and he would fire his kiln about twice a year after about 1988. There was a big, important time for people to come together, get to see Billy. It was almost like a family reunion twice a year at Billy's Pottery Shop. Um, an interesting thing about his shop is that it is built from pieces from what is believed to have been the John Smith Pottery Shop. And then his kiln was built from bricks from one of his historic family kilns from the Henson. You can see here, um, there's a little kitchen over here to the side. Anytime there'd be a fire and they'd have a giant pot of beef stew cooking, they'd have a big pot of beans cooking. And then the best part was they had a little pot-bellied stove where they would cook fried apple pies all day. 
Um, but here, it was a full day event. He would start heating up the kiln very slowly, about seven o'clock, seven thirty, and just gradually increasing the temperature. You know, when pottery is still green and in the kiln, you can't do it too fast, or else there will be air that escapes too soon, and then all the pots will explode. So it's a very gradual process. By about four o'clock in the afternoon, you finally reach about eighteen hundred degrees, and you want to get all the way up to about two thousand degrees, which is still a pretty fast firing process. But this photograph was taken right at blast off. So this is as hot as the kiln would get. You can see the flames coming out of the top of the chimney. Here's a close up of the firebox. Then after it got blasted off all the way, the pots would be almost translucent on the inside. And this is kind of what they look like. You can see the bricks of the kiln glowing in the background. <clears throat> so after that, he would seal up the front of the kiln and it would cool down very gradually, very slowly to keep things, again, to keep things from cracking and exploding. Um, and then about midweek, he would unload the kiln. And then the following Saturday, because his work was in such demand, he would have a sale using the lottery system. So you'd get there, you'd get in line, you'd pull a number out of a tin can, you could be number one, or you could be in number 150. But you can see all the people here scoping out which pot they want to get uh, whenever they get their number. But having Billy Henson here um, in his community also helped influence other artists in the area, including his brother-in-law, Billy Green. Billy Green saw all the attention that Billy Henson was getting and recognized that. He knew he was part of that tradition, too, from being in the area. So he built his own kiln and started his own pottery shop. <clears throat> so this is one of Billy's face jugs. And Billy Henson's best friend for his whole life, James Roddy, also hung out at the pottery shop all the time and began to make his own pottery. So this is one of James Roddy's face jokes. <clears throat> so in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, more and more contemporary artists began to see um, sort of how this pottery tradition was sort of evolving a little bit. And they also became sort of influenced by it. Um, this is Michelle Bain, who was a potter from Greenville. Some of y'all might know Michelle, but this is him standing with his um, Barack Obama inaugural vessel that he created. Um, Michelle Bain ended up moving to North Carolina, but was very active in South Carolina as well. Another pottery family that's really intriguing that I've known for a long time are Winton and Rosa Eugene. Um, they are self-taught potters from Calpin, South Carolina. Um, Winton was a farmer by trade, um, and Rosa was a nurse. But Winton decided to make pottery. He made several electric kiln loads, fired them, and the glaze ran. He couldn't get the glaze recipe to work quite right. But Rosa, thanks to her knowledge of chemistry and being a nurse, she was able to help with the glazing process. Um, so they fired another kiln load using her glaze recipes. And then the rest is sort of history, as they say. But this is what their work looks like. They make these really amazing, intricately carved um, vessels. This is a bowl from a series called a minority in relief. So these are relief carved profiles on the sides of this bowl. And these aren't just generic people necessarily, but these are actually individuals that they know. Um, so <clears throat> this person right in the center right here might be Winton's mom. This might be their grandson on the left-hand side. <clears throat> but Winton and Rosa, um, you know, in the midst of the 90s and early 2000s, when face vessels were being produced fairly regularly, they still are today by contemporary makers. They would be asked by other collectors if they would make a face vessel. They weren't really keen on making that. They didn't really like that idea, that concept. Um, but what they would do is make tributary jugs. So rather than making generic jugs with faces on them that didn't represent a particular person, we would make vessels such as this. This is a tribute jug to Emmeline Smith. This was one of Winton's neighbors from when he was a kid growing up in Mons, Louisiana. I just love the way they did the treatment of the hair on this particular piece. It's really an incredible piece. And this piece and several others are currently on exhibit at the State Museum in our current art exhibit called Face to Face, the portrait exhibit. This is one of Rosa's masks that she makes. Other potters um, that 
connect closely to traditional work or artists like Stephen Farrell. Um, Steve and his dad, Terry, were also some of the earliest investigators of South Carolina pottery tradition. Um, Stephen actually went to Furman University and learned ceramics there and then was more influenced by the traditional pottery, such as this Edgefield style face jug that he made in 1999. Then other potters take it a step further. Um, this is work by David Hooker. David actually um, grew up in Spartanburg. He went to Winthrop University for a little while, then he eventually went and got his graduate degree from Kent State. He's now a professor of ceramics, and I think the chair of the department at Wheaton College um, at Wheaton, Illinois. But you can see he's taken the idea and concept of a face vessel, but making it a little bit more personal. This is a family totem with his self-portrait on the bottom, made out of the bricks. That's his wife in the center, and then their baby Abby above, sprouting out of their head, out of the heap's head. <clears throat> this is another massive large scale piece that David made that's in our collection as well, um, called House Two. If you look at it, you see the little golden house down at the bottom left hand corner. From the outside, you see a house and everything seems perfect and in order, and like everything's you know, just going like it's supposed to, but you know, always in the shadow, in the background, there's always a lot of other stuff happening too. You're always busy, you're always running around. Um, so you can kind of see these things in the, in the shadow of the house. But if you look closely, he's still really interested in the idea of traditional face vessels by incorporating these faces into this work. You know, it's completely different than the Edgefield tradition and the upstate tradition or even contemporary face vessels, but it ties into the figurative or anthropomorphic elements of face vessels. Another artist that was in the upstate of South Carolina, a contemporary maker was Dennis Stevens. He was also a contemporary studio potter, but became influenced and interested in the idea of using a jar as sort of a form of journal. So he started writing things on his vessels. Um, I think the title of this one's called The Problem With My Palm because he went to a palm reader and they said one thing and then something else completely different started to happen. Um, but a lot of the early Edgefield potters would stamp and mark their pottery, Chandler Maker, C. Rhodes Maker. So you always had Maker at the end of it. That was a way to sort of give a, uh, guarantee that the pottery would be good and you knew who it was coming from, so they would stand behind their work. So Stephen and a few other people started marking their pottery the same way. So he marked all his Stephen's makers. <clears throat> Another potter um, or ceramic artist is Peter Lindsay that came from Michigan to South Carolina um, in about 1992. Um, he came here and he was a contemporary artist making these altar pieces. Um, contemporary altar pieces that incorporated ceramics. He was in a bicycle accident and couldn't use power tools anymore. So then he went just to purely using ceramics for his work. He was teaching middle school at the time and started talking about Edgefield face jugs to the students to try to get them to know about that work and the history of their state. So he was making face vessels as sort of demonstration, but then he became enamored by that. Eventually, um, his son, Joe Lenzo, was in the studio and there were broken pieces of pots and his dad had some greenware that he just made with faces in it. And Joe started picking up the pieces of pots and sticking them into the wet clay. And at first he thought, what are you doing to my pots? You're messing them up. But then he was like, wait a second, this is pretty amazing. This is one of his more traditional face vessels. This is Joe, his son. And so after Joe started putting the little shirts into the pots, that gave Peter a whole nother idea. And so Peter started collecting baby doll molds for um, cast arms and legs and things like that and making his own parts to add to these vessels. So he refers to these as face jug fetishes. And it's really interesting to look at these very closely and see how the objects, even though he does it kind of randomly, to see how they're interacting with each other. We have probably about 15 pieces by Peter Lindo in our collection. Um, he has since moved out of South Carolina um, and moved back up north. But um, he contributed a lot to the visual culture of South Carolina for sure. Now, moving beyond all the traditional ceramics and pottery uh, that exist, which is just a massive history in South Carolina, there's so much that we could talk about and spend a lot of time um, digging deep into. There's also fine art that exists in South Carolina. This is a piece by, um, if you've ever been to Aiken, you're familiar with the equestrian tradition that's there. Um, in the horse tradition that exists in that area. It's really important to that community. Um, one equestrian sculptress 
was Frances Bryant Godwin. So she was actually from New York and came down and spent summers in Aiken. And while she was here, she would also continue her work. So this is probably one of the earliest non-traditional, non-functioning sculptures made in South Carolina. This is from about 1930, it's titled Workhorses. Um, and she probably used clay from one of the local potters in Aiken, inspired it. But rather than being a sculpture that would have been made to be sold, most likely, it was probably made as a study for this bronze because she was known for her bronze work. So this is Mare and Fold. It's also in the museum's collection, which we were able to acquire after we acquired workhorses. This is the work of Virginia Scotchy, um, also a contemporary artist in South Carolina. She's known um, all around the world for her spheres. She makes these giant ceramic balls and orbs. They're placed in water fountains and gardens and places um, all around. And she has been here since 1992. She came here as a ceramics professor at the University of South Carolina. But this is an installation that she did when I first got to the museum in 2001 called La Familia. And it's a multiple piece installation. All of these vessels here are crucibles. And they are all fired clay with the bronze glaze. And it's the idea that these are vessels that hold things just like families and ideas and individuals hold ideas as well. So this is also part of the museum's contemporary art collection. <clears throat> and similar to Virginia working at USC, not too far up the street at Winthrop University. I'm sure some of y'all are familiar with Jim Connell who has been at the university teaching ceramics and is known for his carved vessels. This is a carved porcelain pitcher that we have at the museum. This is a slab built platter by Charleston ceramic artist, Nina Liu. We're very fortunate to have a good collection of her work too. That's kind of a highlight of the collection. Uh, for the most part, the majority of our collection is usually in storage. We pull it out from time to time. There are pieces in our recent acquisition show on the fourth floor right now. There are some pieces on the history floor. There are pieces in the art gallery right now. But we probably have close to 500 pieces of ceramic arts total in the collection. Um, and they rotate periodically for different shows. This particular slide illustrates Fine Folk and Fancy, which opened in 2000, right before I got to the museum. I'm sure there were shows before that. But then, like I said, the difference in dirt, um, I followed it to the museum after doing that at the Museum of York County. <clears throat> Since then, we've done exhibits uh, focusing on the Johnson pottery tradition, as well as the Savannah to the PD, working with multiple museums, looking at pottery that was made in the Midlands, above the Fall Line region. And then the Holcomb family, who I haven't mentioned a whole lot, but it's really an important family to talk about and look at, um, that really started researching pottery early on in South Carolina in the 1960s and early 70s through the 80s. Um, they were really recognized for their collection and the material that they were able to acquire. And then we were very fortunate to be able to share that in an exhibit called Tangible History. Um, they were very private collectors. They didn't like to share their collection with anybody or let people see exactly what they had. So we were able to borrow 56 pieces for an exhibit called Tangible History. And these are just a few of the highlights from that. You can see the massive water cooler that's in the center of the picture. It's actually an iron slip, alkaline glazed water cooler that uh, I think is about 10 gallons. It's about this tall, double handled, and is inside um, Chandler Maker, incised on the surface in handwriting. This also represents Edgefield pottery, um, Welchel pottery, and others. Now, even though we don't have an Edgefield face vessel in the collection yet, we're still working on that. Uh, we have had several exhibitions because of such the import of the importance of this tradition in South Carolina. So this is one that we did um, in about 2015, where we brought in about 17 vessels. We looked at archaeological sherds that were excavated from some of the pottery sites that had eyes or noses or mouths or things like that connected to. And then just recently, um, this past July, we closed another exhibit called Early American Face Vessels from the George Meyer Collection. Um, which had about 20 Edgefield face vessels in it, plus another 
um, about 80 or so space vessels that were from all around the United States. So it was a pretty massive exhibition and we were fortunate to have that in the museum. Now I mentioned the majority of our collection is always in storage. Um, you know, that's accessible to researchers. You just have to call and make an appointment at some point. Um, but in the not too distant future, we are gonna be able to have our collection accessible online. So the museum's undergoing a major website renovation and change. We're gonna have a new website, hopefully by the end of the year, if not first the next year. And thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Ser Services, we have been able to digitize our entire art collection. So over the last couple of years, we brought in specialists that were able to catalog everything, update the information, as well as take high resolution photographs. So this is just a screenshot of some of the images of what is currently in the collection. And hopefully um, that will all be available in the new website as well. Now, I said that we continue to collect and we're still looking for important objects. Um, this is a piece that just came in a couple of months ago. So I mentioned the Johnson Pottery in Lawrence County, South Carolina. You know, out of all the potteries, they were one of the shops that signed or stamped or marked their pieces um, extremely rarely. They hardly ever did that. There's a couple of pieces that are J and J. Um, there's one that I've heard that has um, Johnson written on the side of it. But, you know, other than that, I've never seen that many pieces. This particular piece was um, from someone that contacted us, uh, called me at the museum and said that they had a jug that uh, they believe was Johnson. And if you look closely at it, it has EGB on the side of the vessel scratched into the surface underneath the glaze. Now, there were itinerant potters that traveled all around the state to different pottery shops to work. And one of those was Edward Guy Boggs or Ernest Guy Boggs, um, which is EGB. So that's the initials on this particular pot. This form also is consistent with Lawrence County pottery. So that's good. The glaze is consistent. If you look closely, you can see a little bit of root heel coming through. But the really great thing about this vessel is that down here underneath the initials, it also says Lanford Station, which is where they were actually working. And it's Lanford, ST, and then SC for South Carolina. And there's also marked five for five gallons of capacity. So we're always looking for important pieces that continue to tell the story of South Carolina. So 